Listener Production. The creators of this podcast would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which it is recorded. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the first storytellers of this land. We pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, as well as any Indigenous people who may be listening today. Everyone relax. This is Tofop with friends. Uh, I am Will Anderson and my friend today is Justin Hamilton. He's working without a microphone. We're just recording this raw dog straight into his computer because we just spent half an hour, yes, absolutely half an hour, trying to do the simplest of all things, which was trying to get your microphone connected to your computer. But the two of us geniuses, the two of us uh, men in our nearly 50s and 50s, uh, really, I mean, all I was trying to do was get your thing to do what my thing is doing mm. like, because I don't have any level of knowledge greater than being able to go, hey, I, on my computer, if I do this, this and this, this works. So I assume if you do this, this and this with pretty much the same equipment, it will also work for you. But somehow we managed to absolutely not get it to work in any possible way. But regardless of that, Justin, I think that the audio quality is going to be absolutely fine and people can hear you fine. Welcome to the show. I work really hard on not feeling old and being old and, you know, being across things. And at this precise moment in time, I feel like an utter failure and I'm going to go and yell at clouds. That's where I'm at now after all of that. Well, I mean, yelling at clouds, I mean, I assume this audio, the, the part of the problem is that we usually record old school on Zoom. And so we'll be looking at each other on Zoom, but we're just recording the feed separately at our own ends. And that means that there's like, you know, good audio on each end and it gets all weaved together. But this is the new era on Riverside. And basically the idea is meant to be that we can look at each other, but it's all recorded at the same time. And all the audio immediately goes into a cloud where it's easier for it all to be edited because it's mostly already you know, together as audio. Um, so this was meant to make it easier, but for the two of us, it has absolutely made it so much harder. <laughs> no, I'm old school. I like the old ways. I don't want to, everything to improve. I don't want things to be easier. I want shit to stay exactly the same as it was when I understood it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it'll sound, I think it will sound absolutely fine is the truth. Yeah. Like it'll yeah. just sound slightly tinnier. Basically, yeah, most like podcasts these days, there's so many people who don't have their mic- home microphones regardless, right? You know, people aren't used to studio quality and it's not like I am sound like I'm talking to you through the, you know, drive through at a McDonald's or something like that. You still sound pretty good to me as I speak to you. And so I just think for people at home, they're just going to get a little bit more old school AM radio style Justin Hamilton today. Yeah, pretty good is the level that I aim for mm. all the time now. <laughs> I know that's as far as it can get. Everything, if I can get to pretty good, mm. that to me is nailing it. Yeah, I get that. I, I never want the audio to be better than the comedy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gee whiz, he didn't make me laugh once, but it was so crisp. Sounded so good. I could oh. hear the silence between jokes. Yeah. <laughs> I hear that enough in my head. I don't need to hear it again on the audio. Also, it's not like I'm recording in pristine recording equipment conditions. I'm at the kitchen table. I've got the back door open. I've got the front door open. So there is a breeze that is blowing through the house. There is no soundproofing or anything like that in my setup. I haven't even found the quietest part of the house. So if the neighbour starts using the leaf blower, which normally happens when I record on the weekends, the leaf blower will start at some stage. So it's not even like the fact that I'm speaking into a microphone. I'm, I'm, I've, I'm really – I'm one step ahead of the bare minimum, but mm. not, that, not that much further than the bare minimum. See, I've gone the opposite. I've gone, uh, I live on a very busy road in uh, uh, just outside of Sydney in Australia. And uh, what I've done is I've closed the door and I've got a fan on just a little bit. I can't have it on too much because then it'll be too Mm -hmm. loud. And then uh, by the end of this podcast, I'll have sweated so much, I'll have flushed my skin and and I'll look like I'm 50 again. Well, I am amazed at the way that your skin looks, honestly, because I'm staring at it through the screen right now. And, like, your forehead in particular 
There's a lot of it. Well, I mean, there is a bit of it. I, that wasn't yeah. what I was going to comment upon, but I was going to say there is quite a lot of it. And I will mm. say this, like look stern or like like do something. Like you don't have a lot of wrinkles, do you? No. No, this is all natural as well, baby. Like, you know what I've never done? Yeah. I've never stepped outside and I've, <laughs> I've never thought too much and, it, and it's worked really well for me. I mean, I've never really noticed till today, but you have a very – wrinkle-free forehead like yeah like if i didn't know better it was it's the sort of wrinkle-free forehead that you would literally suggest that somebody had been going for a little jabby jabby Mm. getting a little bit of extra work done to it but i know you're not doing that and i know as a comedian that you wouldn't do that because you know it wouldn't be particularly good for someone who's as expressive as you (laughs) on stage to suddenly not be able to move their forehead in any way hang on a minute that sounds like he's being serious (laughs) but i guess until today yeah i never quite noticed how without wrinkle you are it is one of the uh, core benefits of mm. uh, having a cowlick that eventually turns into a receding hairline. Mm. Uh, you get to reveal that you have quite smooth skin. It's and, very uh, smooth. And I, I gotta be Remarkably honest, smooth. Yeah, people have remarked on it before. Mm. Like, uh, you know, I don't mean to uh, be talking myself up, but I have had a number of people in the last 18 months tell me, how, how smooth my skin is for a 50-year-old man. I've got to be honest. 51. It's weird to me that I haven't noticed it until today. Maybe it's the, you know, they say when you lose one of your senses, then your other yeah. senses compensate. And maybe yeah. today because of the audio issues that we've had, yeah. maybe my visual senses have. You're, you're super focused. Or maybe it's the fact that usually when I see you, I'm not wearing my glasses. So I'm wearing right. my glasses today because we're on the computer. So, But usually when I see you, I have the every Thing that's up close has the faint blur that mm. now my life exists in. Whereas yeah. now that I'm seeing your forehead in all its sharp HD HD glory, yeah, yeah, that's um, that's a fucking smooth forehead. That's what it is, baby. It is. That's good. I always, uh, I've, I've, I've had moments of going, mm. fuck. I wonder if I could pull off the the Bruce Willis, yeah, but um, or. The Michael Chiklis mm. the, around the shield, but I'm going to have to get super fit bef- before I. Because if 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 you shave your head and mm. you're not super fit, you just look like a dollop of vanilla ice cream on a warm summer's day, just losing all all form as the rays hit you. Yeah, but you're in pretty good nick at uh, the moment. I'm all right. Like I mean, I reckon like maybe not Bruce Willis at his peak, Nick, but definitely. Chickless, even at Chickless's best, I'm not sure Chickless has ever been quite in your shape. I would, I would say, I mean, because Chickless may be more muscle. Yeah. Like you know, there's been times when Chickless has like you know got pretty buff, but I'm not yeah. sure that Chickless would have ever been as felt as you are. Well, that's what that's what I'm thinking. Maybe maybe I put on the muscle and then because yeah. uh, then you can go the shaved head and the the, the intellectual thug. That's the look I'm going for in my late fifties. Yeah. Yeah. I reckon you could pull that off, actually. Yeah. The thinking and man's chickless. The thinking man's chickless. <laughs> yeah. That's what I've been aiming for for a long time. It's good. With this smooth forehead, what am I wasting it, like, holding on to this hair? Um, speaking of chickless, where you and I were – quite big fans of um, a television show called Winning Time, which yes. I assume you've watched the final episode of by now. Yes. And the actual final episode of, which is one of the great modern day television tragedies because that show I would have loved to see 10 series of and I cannot believe that it is finished after two and obviously had to rush to a conclusion. It's so sad that it has. And one of the things that amused me about that show is – it's not a show that had rushed up until that point. It was absolutely taking its time with some of the things that was exploring some of the storylines that it was, you know, and one of them, which I thought they had, were doing just so beautifully, was that particularly over the second series, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who many people only know from his iconic, completely bald-headed, shaved-head look, 
the, in the show had been gradually getting a bigger and bigger board spot. Mate, it was one of the little touches that made me love the show even more. It was perfect. And I was like, geez, they've done a good job with that. They've just planted that so that that moment we're all going to see where Kareem decides to get rid of the hair, it's going to be earned because they've put the work into making sure that it looks like he's getting a bigger and bigger ball patch. And then the show gets cancelled and I'm like, well, they've done that for nothing, haven't they? That was a waste. <laughs> I'm so angry. <laughs> a, a whole lot of people out mm. there hate watch and just like that. Mm. I, I know heaps of people who watch it mm. and nobody likes it and they tune in every week. I know if, if, that people even get a subscription to Binge or wherever it is so they can watch that. And Winning Time to me was my version of that except I liked it and I was really into it. And I, and I, I don't care that I knew where the story was going. I was enjoying the performances. I was enjoying the way they were putting it together. Yeah, you could argue they were doing some character assassination on people like Jerry West, but also Jason Clark as Jerry West was probably my favourite character. So, you yes. know. Yes, so funny. So funny. So great. And, you know, just just watching a dude get angry because he wants to win so badly and he can't win and he smashes shit. Well, that were the days. <laughs> so, of course, Michael Chiklis was also in Winning Time. Like, it was such yeah. an all-star he cast was great. as well. He was great. Every single person who was in it was great. I mean, the yeah. kid the kid who played Magic Johnson was oh, yeah. one of the all-time great castings. Ooh. Like, phenomenal. Like, phenomenal. Like, Magic, you know, in all sports, I would say probably, you know, Magic's number one and Viv Richards. Yeah, the cricketer is number two. I'm not telling you the cricketer for anyone who's overseas who doesn't follow cricket. I understand. Yes. <laughs> the master blaster. The master blaster. Sir Vivian Richards. Mate, I loved him. And uh, and I love Magic. He was my guy. And, uh, you know, if, if anyone was going to be kind of annoyed because they didn't quite get it right, it was going to be this guy. And I, and I loved him. I thought he was pitch perfect. I loved every second that he was on the screen. It was not a documentary, like, no. and I think that anyone who is going to watch it thinking it was some sort of documentary retelling of that era was completely mistaken for what they were going for. But it was a heightened reality and yet still incredibly grounded in reality, and I think that is so difficult to do. And I think maybe that's the thing that at the end confused too many people, which was that it was not – too far away, like so far away from what happened that they were like, oh, this isn't exactly what happened or these people weren't exactly like this. And you're like, yeah, that's kind of the point of though. It's like a heightened reality version of what happened. Yeah. So, look, this is an easy thing to say in hindsight, but maybe what they should have done at the very beginning of it is they should have had some guy looking at the old forum and the, the Lakers are about to open at the at their new uh, place downtown in LA, and it's uh, a complete made up character, a composite character who's maybe like a trainer or something like that. And some young kid says to him, "Hey, you were there at the start, weren't you?" He says, "Oh yeah, I was back there with Doctor Bus. I was there when Magic joined." And he said, "What was it like?" And he says, "Well, you know what." This, this is, is how, how I remember I it. Remember it. <laughs> and then we just get away with shit not being quite right. Like we're saying straight up, this is, this is not 100%. This is what we're giving you is a series that's not a documentary. What we're doing is we're giving you a series that gives you a feel for what it was like to be following that team back at that point. Yeah, I think they did a thing during it where they would often up on screen, they'd, like when something outrageous happened, they go, this actually happened. Oh, and Larry I, Bird playing in jeans. And I think that they thought, and I actually thought as well, so I'm not saying they got this wrong, that that was you know them pointing out that some of the other stuff wasn't exactly how it happened as much as it was saying, you know, he, but I think for some people it had the opposite effect, which was, that like it almost like they're only look look at them pointing out that this actually happened. Remember when that other crazy thing happened and they didn't point out that this actually happened? Isn't doesn't that imply 
that anyway, fucking, it's, it makes me so angry that that show because I didn't know also that they were finishing it up. So as I went into the final episode, and then I was suddenly like, "Hang on, what's going on? Why are they hurrying this up? Hang on, why are they telling me what happened in the next like ten years with the hey, what? Hang on, what? 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 <laughs> it was it was it was going to a perfect place to finish a season <laughs> to make you hungry for yes. the next season. And uh, you I can't have say, a show called Winning Time that finishes on a loss, mate. What are you a, talking about? <laughs> it's a devastating moment. It's a devastating moment for us true believers <laughs> who went, who lived through that. I lived through that series. That was my second series <sighs> that I ever saw. And uh, I tell you what, though, that kid who played Larry Bird, he was mm. also fantastic. His ability to mimic his shot was out of control. And uh, as a guy who's also a Pat Riley fan, watching, you know, in the second season, it was almost like the Batman Begins of Pat Riley as he finally comes into his own. Oh, uh, it was, I mean, it was Pat Man Begins. And it was I, Pat Man Begins. <laughs> I, Pat Man Begins. And I was looking for the same thing with Kareem. You know, you knew the moment when he was going to shave off his hair. Mm. That was going to be similar to that moment where Pat Riley slicked back his hair. Yeah. And again, it was this heightened retelling, this like – it felt like, you know, it was about these, you know, cocaine fueled party times, LA era of, you know, basketball going from like a sport to, you know, the entertainment franchise that the Los Angeles Lakers would become. And it always felt like, yes, that's the way the story was being told as well. Like one of those old Studio 54 style, yeah. you know, retellings where. Yeah. Like if you remember it all perfectly, then you weren't actually there for it all. Like. And the fact that, it, you know, the people who were doing it, this isn't the story of some reliable businessman who came in and had his reliable business plan. You know, like this was the story of like, a, you know, a crazy salesman, like a crazy partying salesman who came in and set up one of the most successful basketball franchises of all time and not always in the most reliable or, yeah. you know, sensible ways. And I, I felt like much in that confessions of a dangerous mind style of way that there was it was implied because of the characters it was telling the story about that there was always a sense of well this you know is just a version of of you know this is a fairy tale version of what yeah. happened based on true events but very much a fairy tale version of it. It was combining two of my favourite things, 80s Lakers basketball and Boogie Nights. Right. right? Maybe there should have yes. been a scene where the colonel comes in and yes. says, hey, Magic, I hear you got a great big cock. <laughs> Can I see it? Magic yeah. pulls it out. Why, thank you, Magic. Why, that maybe is, we should have just had a yeah. moment like that. <laughs> it just turns to the camera and goes, well, that is a Magic Johnson. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Should have called it Ball of Nights. There you go. We could have uh, had the best of both worlds. Yeah, the, we should have it said at the start that it was set in the Boogie Nights universe. Yeah. Yeah, Dirk Diggler's there trying to record another <laughs> album. Like, I'm, I'm totally up for it. Get someone playing Burt Reynolds. You know, uh, I I, I – I, I remember on the, God, what podcast was it? Maybe I reckon it's a Bill Simmons podcast where he, you know, he worked with Magic and he said to him, uh, you know, back in the day, Dr. Bus and Hugh Hefner both like the same girl who gets who gets it. And Magic just went, whew, Dr. Bus. <laughs> and it's <laughs> like, and I was kind of enjoying that aspect of, uh, of, of, that performance as well because it, it, it's not it's not like you see him perform like that normally. So watching him play a stud was uh, uh, John C. Riley was just fantastic. I mean, John C. Riley was. So, I mean, it, again, everyone in this thing was amazing. Like it was like most of the actors, it was the performance of their lifetimes. And I think that the thing for me too, having like lived some of my life in Los Angeles, like you know. I guess five years total out of my life I spent living there, you know, in bits and bobs, but like, you know, probably about five years if I added it all up together. The thing that I always thought about that city is it's a city built on lies and exaggerations and myths and mythologies and, you know, like it's always a castle built on a house of like sand, you know, <laughs> like it's just like it felt so, of course that's the way you'd tell that story about LA and that time because that's what LA is. It's a yeah. it's a town of stories and myths and lies and exaggerations and 
yeah, anyway. Well, and also that, that era was uh, notorious for, you know, cocaine was rife and it wasn't necessarily seen as a bad thing, you know, like it was – you know, maybe you shouldn't do it, but it wasn't seen as something that you get addicted to or, you know, the, uh, the, the the NBA players back in the day used to love going and playing in Golden State because there was this notorious hotel that they stayed at that was just chock full of the fucking white lines, you know, and it was, uh, you know, if you go and look back in history, there, it turns out a lot of players, if they play the, if they get in the night before, don't play very well the next day. <laughs> They keep jacking up shots because they are confident. Just so confident. <laughs> Just trying to snort the free throw line. <laughs> you know, no wonder, you know, that you'd have those crazy brawls and things like that. It's usually people coming down. That's what it is. If, um, if, if we were going to do a winning yeah. time yeah. for an Australian sports team, oh, yeah. where, where do you want to go? What, do you, what era do you want to do? What do you want to exaggerate? I mean... If it hadn't had such tragic consequences, that that sort of Ben Cousins, Daniel Kerr, Chris Judd era, West Coast Eagles, you know, the oh, – yeah. Like, I mean, again, like, I mean, like because they were so successful, but obviously there was this culture in Western Australia of them just being kings of that entire state and then being able to do whatever it is that they wanted to do, which eventually led to some quite disastrous, you know – consequences like I mean there was a guy who died and cousins and Kerr ended up in prison and like you know there was a whole it, it ended very badly but there was a, a time when they were unstoppable both on the field and off the field and I think that Western Australia at that time you know again like you talk if you're talking about not just a team but like a a state and a time and place then yeah I think that that would be the immediate one that came to my mind so the Wild West. Yeah. The winning ways of the West Coast Eagles. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? It's like when you yeah. think of the great dynasties in Australian sport, none of them seem to have that bit of Hollywood, you know? It's like, like do we want, a, do we want a, a series about uh, the 80s Hawthorne team? Well, see, I mean, Dermot Brereton had a little bit of that about him, but the rest sure. of them didn't really. <laughs> no. Oh, here's Chris Mew going to bed. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Gary is. He's telling Robert to be a Domenico off again. <laughs> Dipper, go to bed. Okay. <laughs> Next week on Hawthorne. <laughs> yeah, but that early 2000s Eagles, like that was the start of like professional sport being worth a lot of money. They were young, good-looking guys. They were kings of Western Australia. Western Australia, this like sort of remote sort of, you know, city where these guys just ruled the roost and like, you know, and again, like drugs and, you know, sex and all those sort of things, but success as well. Like it wasn't just, you know, all those things combined. There would be, if it hadn't ended so badly, it would be a very fun story to tell. I mean, even though it did end badly, I suppose you could. There's still a, probably a fun, fun bit of the story you could tell. Right. But because it ended so badly, I don't think people would find it as fun. What What about? Um, may, maybe we need to broaden. What about eighties tennis? Because you get you get McEnroe, you get Connors, you get Ivan Lendl being the stick in the mud. You get Mats Filander, you get Pat Cash. You know, tennis tennis back then was swashbucklers. Do you know what I mean? Like the and you had Vetus Gerolitis and you know they all used to get together and play music all night. And sometimes they'd even use their instruments. Like it was, <laughs> um, you know, maybe maybe that could be a, a fun thing. You know, all them all hanging shit on Ivan Lendl because he's getting a good night's sleep and training. I mean, I think part of the joy of the winning time story though was that it's a team sport, right? Right. I think team sports are much more interesting than individuals. But I mean, basketball is great though because, like, the problem with say, you know, if you're going to do like a like an early two thousands West Coast Eagles winning time, like, is that there's twenty you know players on a like, whereas like there's just that the right amount of players in a basketball team that you can have enough for the story and the storylines around it and whatever yeah. without it getting so overwhelming that you need to like ten players. Yeah. Two main guys, mm. 
three guys you really check yeah. in with. And then the rest a are kind of there. A guy wearing glasses <laughs> yeah. and the others. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Kurt Rambis. Um, do you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. it's enough, but also it's a, it's a good team sport in the fact that one player can make a difference. Oh, like lots of team sports, you, you yeah. need more than the one. I mean, there was that era where I think Christopher Scase, the disgraced Australian entrepreneur, Christopher Scase owned the Brisbane Bears. Is that right? Like that, I oh, mean, yeah. that Is might that when be... he got um, Warwick Kappa? I'm gonna say I'm gonna say that that was around that era, and so Cause that Eccleston kind of had... feels like, um, yeah, that'd be crazy. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Let's see. Um, uh, AFL sank its claws into Queensland thanks to Christopher Scase and the Brisbane Bears. Okay, beautiful. Uh, it was the eighties. Oh, this is good. This is a good article. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> right. This is from ABC Gold Coast. Uh, Sulua Middleton wrote this on uh, Sunday, the 22nd of March, 2020. Of course, the Brisbane Lions, as they are now, not the Bears, uh, just narrowly lost the AFL Grand Final this year. have had a great era of success, but started their life as the Brisbane Bears. And uh, here we go. It was the 80s. The hair was big. Life was large. And Aussie rules were dirty words in Queensland. Yeah, great. This is perfect. This is, I think this is your era. Well, this is our yeah. opening Star Wars scroll, <laughs> isn't it? A big grey koala wearing tight footy shorts lands on the Gold Coast to become the mascot for the state's first VFL team, the Brisbane Bears. <laughs> Seems appropriate. They're chock full of gonorrhea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, the Aussie rules invasion of Queensland was thanks to tycoon Christopher Scase. And because, of course, for people who don't know the Christopher Scase story, he ended up being a very disgraced, uh, you know, the dodgy entrepreneurs of that era. And uh, he fled to Majorca where he was found wearing a disguise. So, I mean, you know, it does have a little bit of that winning time style sensibility about it, right? Yeah, maybe this is where we start the story. Yeah. Him in disguise. And like I said, a disguise that's so bad that someone says, are you Christopher Skates? (laughs) 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 Uh, Here we go. Um, Oh, this is great. uh, So this is... um, uh, they've interviewed uh, Mark McClure, who was a, a legendary AFL player, um, uh, who was the assistant coach at the time. Um, McClure recalled some good times with Skase, including a night in 1987 when the businessman was seeking members for the Bears President's Club. He picked up 50 members for this club at $25,000 each in one night, a pricey lunch considering there were only 10 home games each season, but McClure then realised the power this bloke had. I know he got caught out in the end, but gee whiz, he was a wheeler and a dealer. <laughs> oh, yeah. T- <laughs> Turned out he was as dodgy as fuck, but also good times. <laughs> Scase became one of Australia's most wanted fugitives before his death in Mallorca in 2001. Um, okay, let's see if I can uh, see who they um, they took up there. So, um, uh, so um, Kappa comes to the coast. This is your, like, these are your storylines, right? Warwick Kappa was the VFL's golden boy when the Bears were formed and it was not uncommon to hear cries of Kappa in the schoolyard. At the end of 1987, Skase, with his financial clout, made the Mark of the Year winner an offer too good to refuse. According to Kappa, he became the highest paid player in the league and was transferred from the Sydney Swans in a $2.4 million package. Um, so did so did he just pay for him? Like, did he just buy him, or yeah. did they? Wow! So he was like a free agent or something like that, and they he just swooped in. I think back then they didn't even there was no kind of concept of free uh, agents con- or anything like that. Free agents? It was just... I'm just going to go there. <laughs> you know, like like it's uh, yeah. Warren Kapper was a, an exciting footballer. Yeah. Oh no, he was a. I mean, he won the Coleman. He kicked over 100 goals a couple, at least a couple of times. So. I mean, that's your era. It's not winning time, but it is like to look back on that era of the the Brisbane Bears, like when Christopher Scase was running. I mean, that's a that's a, and you know Kappa going up to the Gold Coast because that's where they used to play as well. The fact that yeah. they used to play on the Gold Coast, they didn't yeah. even play. Maybe it's called Chris and Barrett. 
<laughs> the story about Christmas case and the and, and the Brisbane Bears on the Gold Coast. Oh man, that's funny. Was 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 Kappa the original Australian to always refer to himself in the third person? Kappa. I mean, he did it so much that I played a um, charity football game at the SCG with Warwick Kappa, and Warwick Kappa, when we were warming up and everybody was. Yeah, you know, playing kick to kick would shout out as his own name as he went for, <laughs> for, for screamers. Oh man, that is like, the best. Kappa! That is that is genuinely <laughs> awesome. So yeah, I'm going to say that he probably was. <laughs> who who was your favourite full forward? Uh, oh, okay. So, I mean, of that era, there was kind of, yeah, there was Kappa, there, there was the greats, there was the all-time greats, Jason Dunstall and Tony Lockett, obviously. Um, I think, you know, Tony, Tony Modra, like, was a little later on, but, like, the, uh, it was, was pretty, right. like, I mean, pretty incredible full forward, Tony Modra, like those marks he took for that period of time when he was at the peak of his powers. He was pretty ama- amazing to watch. Um, yeah. I think technically, I mean, it's it's hard to separate Dunstall and, and Lockett, right? But I guess I kind of was a Lockett man maybe in, in front of Dunstall. And I I think just because Dunstall appeared to be a little bit more clinical, whereas Tony, Tony Lockett just seemed to be something otherworldly you know he didn't really right. look like he should be a footballer but he right. just played with such incredible like power and skill and just he was just so impressive and it's so funny to look at the two of them now you know like i mean jason dunstall has become an incredible media performer like one of the like the thing i always say about jason dunstall is that he can do serious incredibly well as a commentator like his opinions about afl football when he's being serious are always incredibly insightful i think he's kept up with modern times but he can also he's very funny he can play the clown he can do comedy you know very well like he's very adaptable and an all-rounder and then of course tony lockett has completely disappeared not just physically which he has like he's half the weight he was when he used to play but also just did not want to be involved in football or the limelight at all in his post football career and has become quite an enigma in the fact that he's you know disappeared from from view and the like because they're both you know legends of the AFL all-time greats and uh, it's funny to see that they're both gone in such different directions and and in a way like, you know, you're kind of like, oh, Dunstall seemed like the more self-serious, you know, one at the time. And the fact that he's actually been willing to make fun of himself and, you know, like become qu- quite a, you know, really good media performer has kind of surprised me, I guess. Right. What um, we, we shouldn't leave out Ablett as well because Ablett was around that year I mean, too, right? Ablett, yeah. But, I, I, I mean, and Ablett was, I guess, like, you know, kicked a lot of goals, but he wasn't yeah. just a full forward, Ablett. That's the thing. Right. Like I remember seeing Ablett kick fourteen goals playing on the wing one day. Yeah, he, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was. He was absolutely. I guess. I mean, he was equally. I mean, probably more gifted than even both of the other two. Like naturally gifted, but had his you know fair share of troubles off the field. Like wasn't very good at life, but also. You forget about him as a full forward, even though he kicked as many goals as those full forwards did. He, he wasn't like he, you know, could play in the, you know, in the middle of the ground on the wing, like mm. on the half forward flank, and still kick as many goals as he would if he was playing out of the square. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. The um, I was always a Dunstall guy over Lockett for two reasons. One is he was a great tackler out of the forward lines. Like he, if if someone else got the ball and it was streaming out, he was always, you know, he he never gave up on the ball. And secondly, I think he always he he was uh, he, he'd pass it off. Like if he saw someone in a better space, he had no qualms about making sure that the ball got to. 
Oh, yeah, I remember, t- t- yeah, Tony Lockett wouldn't pass it because Tony Lockett knew that there was no he one was who was better at kicking it than him. Yeah, well, <laughs> it was dumb. Well, that, d- that was Dunstall very was dumb to teams. pass it off. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Dunstall had another guy who was maybe equally a chance to kick it. Yeah, yeah. Like- he- <laughs> Lock at you, it's all on him. Now, that's a good point. <laughs> He'd be doing his team a disservice yeah. by giving it to somebody else. Man, I, I, I really miss the era of the, the full forward in AFL. It's one of the reasons that I drifted away from it. I loved, I loved the person getting the ball and passing it to the full forward and I like seeing a bag of goals. Uh, it's, uh, it's disappointing. Uh, well, it's funny. Th- so in the last few years, there's been a trend back upwards again. So, I mean, obviously there was a period of time where like more than one player a year would kick over 100 goals. Like, you know, and back in that Dunstall and Ablett, you know, um, Lockett era, you know, they'd get up towards 150 goals. You know, they'd keep, kick between 10 and 15 goals, a, you know, a week sometimes. There's not that anymore, but you've, there's been a few bags of 10 creep back into it. And there was, I think, three players who kicked over 70 goals this season, which like there was a period of time where you were winning the Coleman with like high 50s, I think, like, right, you know, yeah. for a while. So there has been a return. There's a, there is a chance that I think you'll find in the next few years that somebody might kick 100. I mean, it's still a fair way off for someone to kick 100 again, but, but I think it's possible. I could see it. There's certainly a lot of, you know, good key forwards playing in the AFL again. Right. Man, it's um yeah, I don't know. It's it, it it's funny. I remember when we used to think Peter Sumich was shit because he only kicked 90. <laughs> Right. <laughs> uh, what a terrible full forward. Even Alan Jakovic kicked over 100 for Melbourne. Yeah, I mean, Simon Beasley kicked 100 a couple of times. Yeah. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah. It was fun looking it up. You'd look up, you'd, you'd look up the score and you'd, you'd see Lockett kicked three and you went, man, they did a good job. They really held it. Uh, I feel uh, it, there's the... Uh, younger me is very confused by the things that he's no longer in, into as a as a grown up. I no longer follow football. I no longer follow cricket. I, I haven't I haven't watched a Marvel movie in years <laughs> or TV series. I mean, the Marvel one is like I remember <laughs> saying to Charlie that like at the start when we started doing Tofop, you know, thirteen years ago or whatever it was. Um, you know, wow. we, we used to constantly, like most of the conversations we'd have would be about how to be awesome that like if there was like, you know, extended universes of comic book characters and wouldn't it be great if they made this sort of movie and this sort of character was in this sort of series and now that's all entertainment is and it really proves that sometimes if you get what you've asked for, it turns out that you were fucking wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> no, 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 but the, 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 the bit that they left out was make it good. Oh, yeah. I <laughs> yeah. should have said, could you also make that stuff good? Good, yeah. That's, that was where we uh, messed up. We just mm. took it for granted that they'd make it good. But it's, uh, yeah, it's it's like I'm t- totally divorced from it and it's uh, it's genuinely a relief to see something come on and you look at it and you go, no, I'm good. I don't need to watch this. Yeah, I can't remember when I stopped – watching like Marvel things in particular. I watched She-Hulk um, of their oh, TV yeah. series. Yeah. Um, but I noticed recently that Loki series two came out and I was like, oh, I haven't seen Loki series one. Right. Um, and like I definitely haven't seen the last few movies no. that came out. Like I reckon I've at least missed it. Like I mean, I guess every six months there's a new Marvel movie, so I reckon I've probably missed the last five or six Marvel movies. <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't seen one in ages. I haven't watched a TV series in ages. It's good. It feels good. It feels good to you know not have to be across it. It's it's almost like I'm thankful for them putting out lesser you know product that I can just check out from. Well, I mean, wouldn't it be better if they just didn't make those things though and then you just made something good that you could watch? Well, like maybe <laughs> maybe these people, like maybe the people making them can't make good things, so it's good that they're making something I'm not interested in. So they don't accidentally go over and work on something that I really am into. I mean, it is, in- yeah, I mean, maybe that is the case, right? Like it's keeping them busy. But there was a time where the Marvel, you know, vacation of everything like everything became like, you know, a Marvel movie and then eventually we have kind of all got 
a bit sick of it, which is interesting because I think there was a point where it's like, well, I, I bet, you know, if you were like Kevin Feige and Marvel and whatever, you were like, well, everything that we do is great and people are just going to watch our things forever. And then it must be weird to suddenly go, oh, I think people are over this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like it, it, it still kind of makes money, but not as much money as it no. used to make. And, you know, like e- even people who said that the third Guardians movie was, you know, good, mm. didn't, didn't feel a need to talk any more than that. It no. was like, yeah, no, 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 it was good. It was good. Yeah, no, no, it was good. And you go, okay, that's not enough for me to, to check it out. I'm fine. You know, I, I just think storytelling has become uh, so wonderful in so many other places and it's like, you know, like a, I, I don't know if you uh, ever watched Reservation Dogs, but that just finished its third and final season and that was a, that was a thing of beauty, you know. It was so funny and it was so inventive and it was so creative and you, you got more out of a 22-minute episode of that than you did of whatever the fuck Eternals was. No, I haven't watched it yet, but I did notice that it was coming to a close. I keep meaning to watch it, but uh, I haven't been watching much TV at all, honestly. So I've uh, been, um, like, I think the last time, I think uh, Winning Time finished and Only Murders in the Building finished, and then since then I've been <laughs> like... you too. They've been my two. So I was like, <laughs> well... <laughs> yeah, it's funny because I like even watching TV, like... There was a period of time where I was like, yeah, I'm really like, you know, I like TV and I like, it's the era of prestige television and quality TV and I don't know, at the moment I'm just like not even that into TV. Right. <laughs> right. It happens. <laughs> That's weird. Well, it, I saw I saw six movies last week. Oh, yeah. So I've seen one movie at the movies since The Pando, right. which was with you. We went and saw – well, it was a Marvel – well, DC – like, no, not a DC, Marvel. A, uh, yeah, Mar- a Sony Marvel. Animated Into the Spider-Verse. Yeah, the, the sequel, the Spider-Verse sequel, which was great. Yeah. I thought it was really inventive and really interesting and it was nice to go back to the movies, but that has been my one and only time that I've gone to the movies in the last three years or so. Yeah. Um, so, but you you saw six last week. So, to, and the, like this will date when we're recording this, but it doesn't matter. I don't care. Like no one, no one cares. Well, there's the, two of them are mm. old films, so it doesn't count, mm. right? Yep. So, uh, so I've, I've been watching movies. By <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this is just this just makes me laugh to to from where we've gone to. Uh, I've become a fan of Wong Kar Wai and uh, his uh, films. So, Willy Wonka. No, really don't Wong be like Kar that. Wai? Wong Kar Wai, he, he made In the Mood for Love and uh, is uh, a, a great director. So I saw two of his films, Days of Being Wild and As Tears Go By, which we don't have to talk about because they're old films. So, um, But uh, I saw The Creator, the new Gareth Edwards film. Yeah, what did you think of that? Yeah. What did I think about it? Mm. It was fine. Yeah. It was, you know, it's funny. They, it hasn't done very well and people say audiences just don't want original films. And it's like, yeah, two months ago it seemed like Barbie and Oppenheimer made $2.5 billion between both of them. I, th- I think people just want good, good films. films? Yeah. So we're Bar- So did you see both? I mean, I know you saw Oppenheimer. How many times have you seen Oppenheimer? Like... To realistically, or that doesn't make me sound crazy. No, no, just tell us the actual number. What's your Five. real? What's your O number? <laughs> Five. <laughs> I loved it. Uh, and did you see ba- Barbie as well? Yeah, I loved that as well. I you thought did? they were great. Yeah, I thought they were really fun films. Uh, weirdly in conversation with each other. One is about the Uberus of men. The other one is about the patriarchy. There is a Venn diagram where they kind of overlap. Uh, both clear visions, both tell a you know clear story. I think um, I think both more subtle than people realise. I think uh, part of the uh, one of the most brilliant touches of Barbie is that in that film, Will Ferrell plays the head of Mattel, and he's people were saying, "But Will Ferrell's an idiot. Like, like it should have been like a proper villain." And it's like, no, no, no. But that's that's the statement. The patriarchy allows people like Will Ferrell to rise to the top. So Will Ferrell being that guy is fantastic. And, uh, you know, Oppenheimer, you know, 
I have my thoughts and I love it. <laughs> and I could I could bang on forever and I don't want to bore people shit. No, no, you're happy to. I mean, I mean, people like to hear about you, for, hear from you on the latest Christopher Nolan film. So well, it's been long enough for people to have watched Oppenheimer by now. And this was still, there's a few few weeks between us recording this and when this will come out because oh, okay. uh, yeah. I um, uh, am, oh, you're literally wearing a Dunkirk t shirt. I've just noticed as you. <laughs> I'm a cliche. <laughs> I am an absolute cliche. Um, I've always thought Dunkirk was his best film, even though Interstellar is my favourite. Um, but uh, yeah, look, I, I look, I as as a child of uh, you know the seventies and the eighties, and having an absolute fear of nuclear war, and uh, the the name of Oppenheimer always being something that I was aware of. Uh, having read American Prometheus and then seeing this film and having that life condensed into a three-hour uh, biopic is uh, extraordinary. And it, everything pays off. I know a lot of people feel like after the bomb goes off that why, why do we have this third part of the film? But the, the, the fact is, is that just like the drops on the – you haven't seen it, but there's raindrops that are shown – uh, on a pond and the concentric uh, ripples that it creates. That is what the film is with the bomb in the middle of the film and the, the consequences rippling backwards and forwards through time. Uh, I think it's quite extraordinary. I, uh, Robert Downey Jr. is so fantastic because there's not a part of him that's Robert Downey Jr. He, there's none of his tics. There's none of his mannerisms. Uh He's, I think he's quite extraordinary. I don't think I've ever seen him better in a film. Uh, Killian Murphy is fantastic. Uh, and, and everyone else gets kind of smaller roles, but every role is important. Every role has consequences. Uh, Emily Blunt's character uh, actually sums up the movie and some of her dialogue and the themes of what's uh, occurring and that and takes us all the way through to the end. Florence Pugh has a, a smaller role, but it's important. Everything... Uh, reflects each other. So everything that happens in the beginning reflects at the end. And what I find uh, the most miraculous about the film is not only is it kind of made like a thriller, but it isn't exonerating Oppenheimer. It, it, it questions him. It, it points out his flaws. You, you do follow this protagonist who is brilliant and naive and the smartest man in the room and does fucking dumb things. And, and it kind of leaves it up to you to question what his place in history is. And uh, I, I, I actually think this is now Nolan's best film. I feel like this is everything he's been working towards. And uh, to be honest, I was ready for the Oppenheimer bombs, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> stories that were coming out because when it was being released, you're like, how the fuck is this going to do well? But it has uh, definitively found an audience to the tune of, at this point, of 933 million worldwide. Yeah, and then Barbie has been... Oh, like Barbie's like 1.4 A billion. cultural phenomenon. Absolutely. And it is, and I mean this as a real compliment, it's a movie that's... Uh, entices people who don't go to the movies to go and have a good time. And uh, it has its little flourishes, like it has its, you know, if you're a fan of films, it's, you know, it's got its Stanley Kubrick 2001 opening, which is very funny uh, to, you know, take a, a very masculine movie maker and uh, place uh, his, uh, his cinematic language in this world. But also, uh you know, it's it's there's subtleties to it as well. Like it, like it is obviously attacking the patriarchy and questioning it, but it's uh, quite subtle in some of the ramifications of how that trickles down. And uh, I think it kind of gets short shrift in that regard because because I think you can just go and enjoy it and just have a really good time. But if you want to dig into it, I think it's saying a little bit more than people realise. And I think it's also important for uh, young people who maybe have felt things but don't know how to articulate them. So I know some people my age have been like, oh, I didn't learn anything new from this. And I was like, yeah, but maybe a, maybe a 17-year-old girl in Tasmania who's been brought up yeah. in a cloistered uh, masculine world might 
actually get something out of it. Yeah, so. but also, yeah, that's right. If you're like our age and you go into the Barbie movie trying to learn something new about like feminism or the patriarchy right. or something, then that, that's on you. Yes, but also like there's this there's this weird snobbery to it. <laughs> I didn't learn anything new. It's like nor I, should I you. I can't. I can't. Cope you know with where that you can learn something new at a fucking library Mate, or the internet or university. Like there's yeah. plenty of places for you to learn something fucking new <laughs> at your age, but it yeah. shouldn't be this movie. Mate, go and have a good time. Just go and enjoy Barbie. Like you know, and enjoy the people around you who are talking about things. It's uh, pe- people saying to me, "Oh, it, I didn't really learn anything new at Barbie." And the other one is people saying to me about Oppenheimer, "Oh, just too many white men." Hey, I'm sorry yeah. if you don't want to see a movie about white men. I totally get it. But if you go to see a movie about history, that's what it is. Yeah, I mean, it would be weird to pretend that those conversations or the things that were happening were more diverse than they actually were. Yeah. I mean, that would be... Oppenheimer played by RuPaul. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, don't, I'm not I'm against not this a, as an no, idea. No, actually, I've got to be honest with you. That, yeah, that actually <laughs> sounded okay to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what's a bigger bomb, that dress. <laughs> yeah, I've got to be honest with you. RuPaul is Oppenheimer in Oppenheimer 2. Oppenheimer 2. <laughs> it's all about the shoes. Yeah. But, you know, it's uh, also people complain about, uh, you know, Oh, films are the uh, cookie cutters, and then there's nothing new, and blah blah blah. And then it's like I've seen an extraordinary amount of movies that have been fantastic and have mixed up the form and everything. And uh, you know, what? Do you, maybe just don't go to the films if you can't be happy. Do you think there is a possibility that this like Marvel DC phase that movies have gone through, and it seems to be diminishing returns right now? Mm. You know, people do seem to like. There's certainly a formula to many of these movies that people have gone, okay, yeah, we get it. Like two people of equal, you know, abilities will end up fighting each other or there'll be like a sky beam of some sort of like thing. You know, there's no <laughs> real consequences. No one's ever really going to die, you know. Like, oh, no. <laughs> another sky beam. beam. Yeah. Okay. Can't wait for the final battle of this where the villain has exactly the same powers as the hero. Uh, <laughs> like, So you know. boring. So is there a possibility, do you think, that there is – like, every, yeah, every action has an equal and opposite reaction style thing where we go through this period but it leads to some sort of, you know, th- there might be a wave of, you know, creativity that comes, you know, post what we've just seen. You know, like or a, is it just going to be AI making these sort of movies forever and that's what we're going to be stuck with? No, nah, I, I, I don't know. I just... Um, you know, James Gunn is taking over the DC universe and there's going to be, you know, all the stuff that he he's talking about that he's interested in from the comic book world that he wants to put into films. And I'm just a little bit like, like who kind of gives a shit? You kind of uh, have degraded the iconography to such an extent. Like, funnily enough, the 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 best the best moment of uh, of the protagonist putting on his costume and getting ready to become the full version of himself is in Oppenheimer. <laughs> like, like it plays with the iconography of, uh, of storytelling where, you know, you see Oppenheimer put on the hat and put on the jacket and grab the pipe and you go, oh, that's, that's Batman putting on the <laughs> gloves and putting on the cowl and putting on the cape, you know. Uh, so I, I feel like the, the language of it can be used in other areas that's more interesting. But, you know, I think they've just made too many missteps and now that everything's so blended together. Like I, I, I still enjoyed Matt Reeves' The Batman, which was a film that I didn't really have much desire for. But I still had a good time and thought it was I liked well made. It. I yeah. liked it as well, but I kind of forgot that it happened. <laughs> well, you know, like I so the, the other night when I couldn't sleep, I watched the first twenty five minutes of the Batman, and I was like, oh, that's really good." And then yeah. I thought, "I'll watch the first twenty five minutes of Batman Begins." You know what I watched? Batman yeah, Begins. I mean, it's, yeah. 
like it, like it moves at such a better rate. Yeah. It's just more interesting to mm. me. I like, you know, I, I like a Christian Bale playing different facets of a character. It's not just the one thing all the time, you mm. know, and, uh, you know, it'll be like I didn't particularly enjoy the Joker film, but uh, I'm still curious to see. You know, I like Joaquin Phoenix and I'm curious to see what will happen with Lady Gaga playing Harley Quinn. Mm, yeah. I, yeah, I get it. I mean, what, what happened? Because I just am not interested in any of it anymore, I think. No. I think I did. I must have just reached that point where I was like, oh, yeah, I just. That's just a lot of bad stuff, mate. Like no. it's, you know, it's just there's now like to, to really change it up, you would, like, what, what, what are you going to do? You're going to have Batman and the Joker have a conversation at the end of a movie? Like, there'd be a couple of us that would think, oh, this is a nice change-up, and then there'd other people go, where's, where's the beam of light, man? Where's, <laughs> where, where's the beam of light that he's going to punch? <laughs> what, what happened to this film, man? <laughs> so I think, uh, I think you know, this is, there's, there's directors like Gerwig and Nolan and Villeneuve and, uh, you know, even uh, Damien Chazelle, all, all them, I, I think they, they, they make films and they, they go for it and they put in stuff to raise the bar and I think all these other films have been so lacking in ambition. What they've done is they've lowered the bar. So now it, it would be like giving a kid who's been raised on McDonald's a decent meal, like giving him like a good fucking $300 degustation experience and they'd be like, yuck, because <laughs> their palate's just not rich for it, you know. I, I think that's happened to a lot of people I know that they see these good films and they go, oh, that was boring, nothing's happened. And it's like, well, it's because you've been dumbed down mm. to such an extent that you, you've you lost the ability to be able to focus and take in everything that's happening in what you're experiencing. Yeah, that's interesting. I think you're probably right. It's yeah. It's a like there is something of a that if you're just fed fast food all the time, that your palate changes, right? Yes. Well, you know, it's like when we were kids, and I, I know this is for anyone who's young who's mm. listening to this. A, no I'm one, shocked. No one and is B. young listening to this. I'm so <laughs> sorry if your parents have this on in the car and you're being forced to listen to this. Uh, <laughs> what's a Dunstall? But the, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this was really middle-aged men talk about middle-aged men shit. <laughs> yeah, here it comes. But, you know, like, and, and here's more of it. Like, uh, you know... <laughs> We, we all loved MASH. We watched MASH. Mm. There were episodes in black and white with no laugh track because it was talking about the horrors of war. Were they my favourite episodes? Nah. Did I begrudge it? Nah. Did I still watch that episode? Absolutely I still watched that episode. Like, you know, like could you imagine a, a, any mainstream television show that was ostensibly one thing suddenly being another. Like I think about Moonlighting, you know, Moonlighting, which is uh, going to be released soon. Like that was a thing that, uh, that was a show that kept reinventing itself and breaking the fourth wall. Did and, you say like Moonlighting, the actual old show is being released soon or they're making a... Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. There's being, uh, I think we'll be able to get it. In the States it's Hulu, so I'm guessing here it will be... Disney. Maybe? I'd be interested to see how Moonlighting holds up. Yeah, so would I. Mm. But, but but we took like it it did things and it changed things. Mm. And you but know, I remember at the time it was yeah being quite mind blowing to me like Moonlighting. Yeah. Um. So I'd just be yeah. I but of course I haven't seen it since. So yeah. I'd be very interested to know what it looks like. Like I'm a little bit scared. I mean, it'll be, oh, it'll be slow and terrible and nowhere yeah. near as inventive as we remember it because things have got more inventive since, like particularly, yeah. you know, that HBO-style prestige TV. Like so, yeah. But this was a mainstream show. That's the thing. It was something that was happening in the absolute mainstream at the time. Yeah. Well, you know, it's uh, I went back and watched episodes. So I, I was a big fan of The Great. And that inspired me to go back and watch uh, season three of Blackadder, which inspired me to go back to The Young Ones. And, like, The Young Ones is kind of a little bit slow and scenes take a little bit longer than you expect. Yeah, right. But I'll be honest, you're watching it going, how the fuck did this get made? Yeah. There's no way this would get made now. 
Like no way. Like you just you just couldn't you just couldn't sell it. And it and it's every episode is chock full of ideas and crazy jokes and in, in, impossible scenes. And you know the you know they they had abandoned every episode, and that was because they got more money if they had music in it because then they were a variety show rather than a comedy show. <laughs> so that's how they could get a bigger budget. <laughs> and then you just have Alexi Sale coming in and doing some fucking Marxist comedy for two, three minutes an episode and then disappearing. Like, it, it might have been slower and may have been dated, but it was more creative than, you know, most things. So, you, you know, you know the term, uh, is it Surf Dracula? You know, do you know that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what the, the young ones now would be that they'd finally move in in the final episode. Mm. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this is how they became to live together. Great. So what happens yeah. next? Oh, that's the end of the series. Oh, right. Yes. Right. Yes. You're like, no, 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 no. We just put them in the house and, like, let the adventures begin, right? Yeah. So um, a movie I would uh, suggest, like, mm. you, you like crying in a film, right? Yeah, sure. And uh, I, I saw Past Lives on uh, the weekend. Have you heard about this film? No. It's about uh, a Korean woman who uh, moved from South Korea at a young age to America with her family, and she now lives with her husband in uh, New York, and she's contacted by the boy who was her best friend when she was in high school who oh, yeah. may or may not still have feelings for her. And it is one of the most <laughs> beautiful films I have seen and it is so gentle and it doesn't go anywhere typical, if that makes sense. Like there's the beats that you would expect to happen don't happen and it was like a nice hour and 40-minute film and I felt quite emotional at the end of it and it was uh, it was a thing of beauty to see that and I would rather watch that than fucking Loki. <laughs> <laughs> or Ant-Man or whatever else you want to fucking pitch to me. <laughs> That's where I'm at. I want to see beautiful no. stories about beautiful people uh, dealing with heartache and, and real things. Well, Justin Hamilton, speaking of heartache and real things, it took us half an hour to try to set this up. So <laughs> we have to go. <laughs> we, we have to go. But um, it, it, like we, we said, there's nothing good on TV, but there is something good on TV. It's called Question Everything. It is a show on the ABC that both Justin and I work on. And uh, when you are hearing this, it will have been on for a few weeks, but you can catch all the old episodes on ABC iView or you can catch it 8.30 on a Wednesday night on ABC TV. It's a show that showcases a whole bunch of great Australian comedians being funny on a panel show uh, but also you know making fun of the news and how the news is presented uh, so uh, if you would like to check that out we would love you to check that out particularly on ABC iView. Yeah I reckon it's probably our best season yet because uh, not only you know we're out we're three seasons in so it's mm. uh, you know we're, we know what we're doing better but also uh, the comedians that we have on the show they understand what the show is as well and I think they're all bringing their A, a game so it's been great mm-hmm. to see that and uh, I think Jan's been on fire as well. Yeah which is a great thing for Justin to say one week from us recording our first episode. I'm being so- positive. <laughs> I'm, but I I'm, think I'm I, I think I I think that you're also getting right because like we've done some workshops, well, workshops and those sort great. of things and oh, they've man. been really fantastic because we've streamed. Oh, stream, you're that guy stream in like, fucking Oppenheimer going. That's the wrong flag, mate. It's the feel. I'm going for the feel, mate. Like it's not a. I think you're right. By the way. I think you will be proved to be right because the show be. is more streamlined, um, <laughs> you know, like as you said, like and we've got these amazing comedians that we already have you know, booked for many weeks of the show and I know they're all going to be fabulous. So I yeah. agree that everything that you said is will 100% will eventually be true. But Thank you. For this, for this, let the record <laughs> state that we are a week away from recording our first episode <laughs> when Justin gave us that lovely spiel about how good this series has been. <laughs> Mate, if, if if you say it, it will happen, right? Yeah, I think it will happen. I, yeah. I have full confidence that it will happen. Uh, what can we plug of yours, though, Justin Hamilton? 
So, uh, so, as, so by the time this is up, uh, yeah. so on. Uh, so I've, I've still got the Patreon going for Big Squid. Mm. Everything's been uh, a little bit full on with work for here and at the Chase and blah blah blah. The, it's still uh, the Patreon for Big Squid is still happening, where I'm doing movie reviews and TV and stuff like that. But I'm also recording um, a full length story that's uh it's uh you know it's it's a a manuscript that i wrote uh probably about four years ago called the ultimate and uh each week i'm releasing three chapters at a time and uh on the patreon you can listen to the first three chapters for free at patreon so uh patreon.com forward slash justin hamilton and you can have a listen and see if it uh, takes you fancy uh, I've got some tour dates. People can check all that out at comedy.com.au. Uh, but I would like to say thank you, Justin Hamilton, for doing this episode of uh, Toe Fault with Friends. Thanks for being my friend. Thank you. How long? Not long. Everyone relax. Listener.